Welcome to Rocket Tip, the home of epic React Native content. I'm Simon Grimm, creator of Galaxies.dev, and today's guest is Kitty Kraman. Welcome to the show. You are working for Expo. You have done several courses for front end masters, for Egghead, and maybe also for Galaxies in the future. Just a thought mm -hmm. that we might be coming <laughs> back to at the end. Um, and we're going to talk today about your job at Expo. We're going to talk about EAS, um, and we're going to talk just about great things regarding React Native. So thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me, Simon. Look forward to um, it. I'm, I'm so happy to have you for, for a bunch of reasons. But you just, <laughs> just before this call, you said uh, you've been on vacation for two weeks. So we're recording this right after a new year. Yep. Um, and you haven't touched your laptop for two weeks. This is interesting because <laughs> recently on Twitter, I, I might say, I'm, yeah, well, kind of the same. For the last two weeks, I think I haven't written a single line of code. And that felt really, really good. I really like to disconnect and just like, I got into a fermentation and did my own sourdough bread and oh, like all, nice. that, yeah, all that stuff. And then I read a tweet the other day on Twitter, which said, I haven't been coding for the last seven days. And it was the horrible, most horrible time of my <laughs> life. And I'm like, what are we doing wrong? <laughs> I don't know. I think it's, I mean, everyone's different, but for me, it was really good to have a break. To be honest, I had, uh, I had my family over, they were staying over. Mm, so nice. even if I wanted to code, there was no like opportunity at all because my office converts into a spare bedroom. Mm -hmm. So I didn't really, I would have had to like, you know, get my laptop and be on the couch, um, yeah. which is, which is not the uh, conducive coding environment. But yeah, I think it was really nice. Like I don't, The only problem is when I came back to, so this is my first uh, day back at work no, in 2024. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah. And uh, I, you know, when you leave a pull request open that has comments, so like, you know, you don't finish the year off on a, mm. um, or on mer with merging everything. And then the first day back and you look at this massive PR and you're like, <laughs> What did I do again? I can't remember. <laughs> so I took a bit of uh, getting getting it back back into it, but yeah. it's uh, it's two p.m. now, so I'm uh, I'm 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 back. Nice, yeah. So forgive Katie if if she's not able to answer questions I come up with, <laughs> uh, but I'm also super happy to have you on your for various reasons. First of all, I did the last two episodes alone because I thought, oh, it would be cool to have some solo episodes. And it turns out after two episodes, it's enough. I just want to have guests. It's so much better to have you. Uh, the second reason is that you're the second woman on this podcast. Um, actually, the very first episode was with Hosna, um, which I'm still I'm still chatting with Hosna, which is funny. I uh, knew now you're the second, and I hopefully bring on more in the future. I'm already trying to reach out um, because we, we got that problem in tech. Uh, if you look at like the YouTube watch sets, you're going to have like 90% male people watching your stuff. And I honestly don't know what to do about it. I, I, I try to reach out to more. Do mm -hmm. you see any way out of this? Um, I think it's, uh, I mean, it's kind of a, a tricky one. So my approach or like my thought process on it is just to have a friendly welcoming environment for everyone and then hopefully you know if we lead by example um things will go in a direction that they should you can't force like men or women or anyone else to watch or do things that they don't want to mm -hmm. so you just try to create content um that's maybe geared towards a specific audience i mean for me you know i just do my own thing <laughs> <laughs> which is great I mean, Yeah, so, you know, hopefully, I mean, I know quite a few very talented um, recognition developers who are who are women. So I think we are out there. <laughs> I definitely want to get that list after uh, this conversation because I want to reach out to more of them. I mean, I hope we're going to create something that acts as a like good sign for everyone that everyone's welcome on this podcast. Absolutely. So so um, you had a deadline in December, which you told me about when we initially wanted <laughs> to do our recording. <laughs> First question, did you meet the deadline and what was it actually about? Yeah, so I'm um, right now I was creating a course on Egghead for EIS, so Expert Application Service, so specifically around 
how you create builds like for the various stages, so development, staging, production, and um, the difference between build signing in iOS and Android. That's kind of what prompted it, to be honest. It was how does build signing work on iOS? And then that's that's where the, the whole course kind of ended up being centered around it. Um, yeah, so it's, uh, I think there's like 10 or 11 uh, little lessons where we go through creating um, development, staging, and production builds in EAS with iOS and Android, and then actually deploy them to test light and to Google beta as well. So it goes all the way through. And it's basically a course that I wanted to do for a really long time. And it's whenever I've asked people, oh, you know, what kind of courses, what kind of courses, what kind of content would you like to see? That is always number one on the list. And it's so hard to do because you kind of have to do it for real. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And um, yeah, it was. Uh, it it took a long time to do. Um, it's not available yet, but it's going to be available in in the next couple of weeks. Nice. Um, this is this is great. Um, we're definitely going to talk about the whole EAS <laughs> process and and what it means and everything you just uh, brought up. And I can completely agree to what you said. I did a course for Galaxies about mm -hmm. like publishing your React Native app, but yeah. I didn't really have a topic and I didn't want to build out a huge app. So I kind of had to stop at, okay, now you have to click submit your app for review and, and this mm -hmm. is the course. And but yeah. did you did you actually submit something and release it for, for your course? Um, so I considered it, I didn't release it to the stores, but it's, it's released as far as it can be. <laughs> and actually I, I ran into this fun problem where um, Google very recently, so it was in November, they changed their policies that if you're an indie individual developer, then you can't even um, get to production unless you've had your app tested on, I think it's like 20 different devices. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you need 20 friends with Android phones to test your app before you can apply for production access. So when I read this last year, this tweet that this is the new policy, I, I actually, first impression was this is a bad joke. Mm. And then I read more and like, really serious. Maybe this is only for like new accounts. So what is the current state? I do have a, a, a developer account for Android and I've submitted apps before. If I now do like a new application, a completely new new app, um, do I have to find 20 people to test my app on Android now? So if you created your Google account after this November deadline, then 100%. I'm not actually sure what would what the case is for existing accounts. But my understanding is that they, tr they tried to like roll it out to existing accounts as well. So there was like a cutoff in November that all new accounts will need to find 20 Android friends. Um, but uh, I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure on the old ones, but uh, that was another thing. So I've, I've released like several apps uh, on iOS and Android, but I've always, because I've worked at consultancies, I've always used client accounts. Mm -hmm. So I didn't actually have a personal <laughs> Google Play account. So I was like doing this recording and I was uh, in the middle of recording. I was like, oh, now create an account. And then <laughs> I paused it and I was like, oh, yeah, you know, I'll just edit this part of the video and I'll just create my account real quick. Turns out it's really not quick because you need to prove your identity as mm -hmm. well as your address. And there's a manual approval step there. So it took like a whole week where it was on pause while Google was like, approve my identity, uh, which yeah. is wild. And then actually another thing that I, again, didn't realize, which is like a crazy thing for individual developers, that if you have a paid app, if you want to have a paid app, um, any sort of kind of subscription or anything like that, and you have an individual developer account, then because of the laws around, I guess, some kind of well, I can't, privacy, but I guess it's like fraud, like prevention, the uh, your address will be public on the Google developer page. And this address has to be your personal address because you need to prove it using like your mortgage statement or your rental agreement or something like that. So there's a lot of like gotchas for individual developers. Um, and basically what I've learned is that the best, well, way that I can see is create a limited company and then use that mm. um, for your for your Android Google Play is, account. Is it, is it like for free in the UK to create a limited? Um, it's not expensive. 
Uh, it's I don't, it's not totally free, but it's, it's not expensive. I think uh, you know this is this is the chance where you create a little company in Estonia or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, but it's just another step on like we we started at we want to build a React Native app, and now we're talking about creating a limited company because we need an Android developer account. So this is totally yeah. like. I don't know why this has to be so hard. It's, but also like, it's just because I, I did this course um, for iOS and Android. So I did both of them back to back and it's still wild to me how they're so different. Like mm. there's th different things are complicated on iOS. The build signing is so complicated, <laughs> um, but then you create an account in like two minutes and you know, you have to pay your $99 fee, but th that's it. Whereas for Android build signing, Super easy. Um, creating an account takes a week. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. Yeah, I, I also feel like the whole review process has a bit changed. I don't know. You probably don't have that because your app is not live. But in the past, it was always like Apple takes seven days or something to review your app. And Google was sometimes like, well, yeah, it's okay. Next day, it's it's here. But the last times I released apps, it was actually the complete opposite. Like Apple, 24 hours, and my app was there. And, and Google just... It was almost like seven days. I don't know why, mm. why, like if they change companies or the teams be behind the review process. Yeah, I, I, I remember that as well. But from the past year, my experience was that they're pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. um, so they take like about a day. Google tends to be actually be quicker. I'm just I'm trying to remember. I think it was um, iOS was about a day and then Google was like half a day. So we would always like mm. submit iOS, make sure iOS is submitted and then Google, it would be fine. We're not worried. So it's I mean, that's, that's really fast to be honest. It's like, yeah. Yeah. And then, well, except when you go to the, the random funnel where they, uh, where they dig into your app and you're like, Oh, actually we decided that you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's a whole nother story. Um, but we want to get back into some expo related topics. First of all, you're working for and at expo since I think September last year. Um, I've met several people from expo and they could never really tell me what they're working on. It felt like, yeah, we're doing this and that. And <laughs> like, like, yeah, I don't have a job description. I just do what I can do best. So could you, could you describe what you're best at and what you're doing at expo? I mean, I don't know. I might let you down with the specificity <laughs> of this answer, I'm afraid. <laughs> I mean, so like you said, I joined Expo uh, three months ago in, in September. I think it was 2nd of September or something. And um, I mean, for me, it was a, a huge, very exciting, but a huge change because prior to Expo, I've always worked at um, consultancies, software mm -hmm. consultancies. So I worked at one startup for like less than a year, like in the middle of my consultancies. But other than that, I've just done consultancy work, which is, you know, you're in user land. So you, I'm, I'm mostly building things. So I've done open mm -hmm. source. And like you said, I've done some courses, like educational content. But primarily, my job was to build apps for clients. And joining Expo, obviously, it's very, very different because I'm now taking a step behind the curtain, <laughs> so mm -hmm. to speak. So I'm helping build the tools for other people to build apps. And it's been really, really exciting for me. I've really enjoyed it. But it did mean that um, at the beginning, I've kind of asked um, if I could just contribute to various areas just to get an idea of, like, you know, everything we do. Um, and you know, just there's, there's so much that goes into Expo that I didn't oh, yeah. realize. And now, you know, I've, I've kind of had my hands in, uh, different parts of the various code bases, both open source and some of the internal stuff that we do. And which part did you enjoy the most? Oh, well, one of the first things that I did that was like, you know, kind of public facing was we, um, we added support to bun on EAS and like on the CLI. And I helped with um, basically the EAS support. So that meant that, you know, I was, um, you know, EAS goes across many, many repositories. So actually like, you know, working on something on the CI CD system for Expo was pretty, pretty exciting. I really enjoyed that. I think you also created some shorts or at least short form content that I saw on Twitter around EAS. 
Uh, I was initially under the impression that you might take on the role as like the marketing for Expo. <laughs> Is that, or was this more like a, like a personal interest in creating these kind of um, videos? I think it's, I mean, to be honest, like, like you said, when you talk to people at Expo, everyone's like, oh, you know, I contribute at where, where I can. And I think that was very much true to these sh shorts. So I guess the idea was to try to, over time, Expo has changed quite a lot. So for mm -hmm. me personally, the first time I used Expo was like six years ago. It was like a really early days Expo. And Expo it, six years ago versus Expo now is so different. And because it keeps changing, there's a lot of like misinformation um, mm -hmm. on the internet around like what is Expo in 2024. Um, you know, things like ejecting from Expo like, isn't really... <laughs> I was waiting you know. for that word. <laughs> we, we, try, we want to get people to forget, but that's very difficult. You can't erase things from the internet, I'm afraid. So the idea for these shorts was um, kind of create some like short form content to clarify some uh, common misunderstandings or maybe like, oh, by the way, did you know you could do that? So I think we're probably going to experiment with them a bit more uh, next year, just get, create a more streamlined approach. And it's it's not going to just be me. I'm trying to get everyone to get some <laughs> get some shots in. Otherwise, it would just be, it, it would just be me on the Expo YouTube page. <laughs> I, I I don't know what's your experience, but I found it to be really really challenging to create short videos. Like I can do a 30 minute tutorial about something, no mm. problem. But explaining a concept and even if I know I only got 60 seconds for YouTube, it's so hard. I always go over the time even if I just yeah. want to like explain three lines of code. Do you have the same feeling with, with your shorts? Um I definitely need to cut it down. I mean the way that I did it is that I wrote down what I wanted to convey and then cut it cut it out until I got to mm. like less than a minute. So I think it was like, you know, 59 seconds. <laughs> yeah, my, my biggest problem is always I try to script it and then it would fit. But if I read the script, I'm horrible. Like I couldn't be an actor in Hollywood. I'm, I'm so bad when I read a <laughs> script. So instead I just do like the fr free talking and then, yeah, I, I add random information in every try and it's just, yeah, You'll I gave a, up on a shorts. Short, a short in three parts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Watch the next short. Watch the next short. <laughs> you know when they like say something in the beginning of the short and then at the end, so it makes sense if it just plays again. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I yeah. love those. There's always the kind of, that is that is like uh, there's a next level. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not there yet. <laughs> yeah, me neither. But um, so that's a good place to dive a bit more into EAS. It sounds like you, that's at least one of the areas you found the most interest in at Expo so far. Mm -hmm. Um, so maybe let's take a step back first. What is actually EAS? Could you describe what EAS is from, from the outside for somebody who has never used it before? For sure. Yeah. EAS stands for Expo Application Services, and it's basically, um, a CI CD service for React Native apps. And the, the reason that it's so exciting is that you can build your native app so quickly and it's all set up there for you. So, you know, if you set up, you know, I don't know, GitHub Actions or Circle CI or Bitrise or like anything else, there's a lot of configuration that you need to do to get things like up and running. But Expo Application Services is built to work with your Expo React Native app or even you can run a plain React Native app or even just, um, a native native app if you have the iOS and Android folders. Um, and it's just like really easy to get set up. Um, EAS is usually connected to my, my GitHub repository, right? So that when I do a commit or something, the app would build like automatically rebuild on the Expo servers, right? So you can do that. Um, a lot of the time, if you're, when you start out, you run the CLI command from your terminal. So you will, um, you know, say that you do an expo in it. So you have a new React Native app, mm -hmm. then you do an EAS in it to create your EAS config file. And then you run EAS build platform Android, and then what profile you want to use. So development staging production, and you can set different environment variables, different configurations uh, there, and then it will build the native app on the Expo servers. So you could use it for local development as well as, um, 
like de like deployment builds. But basically, say that I am um, I don't have my native environment set up, so I have a you know brand new MacBook, but mm -hmm. I don't have Xcode installed or anything. So what I could do is I create the Expo app, set up EAS, do EAS build, and it it will upload my code to EAS, build the native app, and then you can download the IPA and then install it on your device. And then that's why if you're, say, uh, on a Windows or a Linux machine, you could build an iOS app that you download on your physical iPhone to, for testing purposes without actually needing to own a Mac, which is really, really useful. And how does EAS handle all the certificate fun? Because you said for iOS, it's uh, it's a pain in the backside usually with the certificates. Um, how does EAS handle this and make this easier for me? Uh, I mean, that is, I think, one of the most magical things about EAS. <laughs> so if, if you... Be, be careful. Developers don't like magic. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So in order to really appreciate it, if you've um, done iOS build signing yourself, so... You know, you go to the, um, you know, the uh, the website, the Apple developer website. You know, you have to request a certificate from a certificate authority and then download it and upload it and save it and then don't lose it. And then, you know, you need to when you need to update it, you your profiles expire, like all that kind of stuff. And it takes oh, I ages. have a new iPad. Oh, it's not included. <laughs> exactly. And like, if you've done that by hand, I think at that point you appreciate. Um, what the EAS CLI does, does for you. So there is an EAS credentials command, which you can run manually as well. And it's basically, um, you log into your Apple account. So this is insert, insert, like saved on, um, your credentials aren't saved on expert service or anything. It's just on your local MacBook on your keychain. So you log into your Apple account and it will create your ad hoc profile for you and it will create your distribution certificate for you. And then every time you run a build, Whenever you do EAS build, if you've added a new capability, say that you've added um, background fetching or you've added payments, then you know you need to uh, enable another capability in your provisioning profile. So it checks it, checks that you need to, that this um, capability needs to be added. It automatically adds it, um, regenerates certificates, downloads it, and it gets saved on expert.dev as well. So you can you can download them from there. And it's the same for devices. So whenever you create an ad hoc build, so on an ad hoc build, you need to have the UDIDs for the devices that it gets installed on as part of the um, provisioning profile. So every time you create an ad hoc build, it goes, oh, these are the devices that this can be installed on. Is this good? Do you want to add or remove any? And you're like, oh, I want to add one. You, you add, add one or you want to remove some or you're good to go. So it all does it on the uh, from the terminal. And for, for Android, it kind of works the same, just following like the Android flow? Yeah, I mean, for Android, it's like a lot easier because mm -hmm. you really need uh, just need one key store for, for signing a build. And then the recommended option for production builds is to have Google manage your key store anyway. Mm. So you just have a upload key store um, that is used to like, kind of sign your app yeah. bundle to upload to Google Play. And then I think 90 something percent of applications that are created now, you would opt into Google managed signing, which means that like Google actually handles the um, like distribution key store for you. Uh, that's great. And all, uh, also, I think now after 20 minutes and your explanations, <laughs> I feel like you finally arrived back at work and <laughs> completely, <laughs> completely involved again into all the expo uh, topics. It's like I've never left. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm so happy that I got you to that state. So um, you said I can also build with EIS locally. I think the first thing is that I can't do an iOS build locally on Windows, right? Because that's just technically not possible. Yes, correct. Okay, so that is a like limitation. Um, yeah, but I mean, if you use the EAS CLI, then you know what you do locally is you just run EAS build, and then this will like upload the code from your local machine to EAS, so you can run this command on a Windows machine. Yeah, but we just have to say, um, if you're on a free plan, like if you're not paying for Expo, 
this might take a few minutes if you get like in a low priority queue. I don't know if you like improved this or made this faster over the last time, but um, if you're not on a paid plan, um, you're going to have to wait sometimes. Yeah, it tends to um, like US, like whenever it's, it's the morning in the US, that's where the queues happen. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's that's like the kind I think the trend that I've seen. So um, if you try to build outside of those uh, peak hours, um, you might 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 do fare better. <laughs> that, that's a good tip, actually. Um, so when I got into Expo, I was really confused by how to build it. To be honest, um, that was like somewhere like early last year. So we 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 already left Eject at that point behind. It. <laughs> um, but but still, I, I came from a background. I actually was a like native iOS and Swift developer, and I got used <laughs> to like using Xcode and just deploying to my device. This is just naturally yeah. to me. And so I came to Expo and I was like, where's the button to just deploy to my device? I just want, and then I went through the docs and I, I, do I really have to use EAS and like a local build? And everything was so complicated. Um, but now you also have like, there's also Expo Go. Mm -hmm. We got EAS and we got the pre-builds. Um, mm -hmm. Could you probably like explain the three things and the differences between them? Because I still get questions all the time from people like, uh, why is this not working in Expo Go? And, and mm -hmm. what is a pre-build? Like in which scenario do I use these three different solutions? Yeah. So Expo Go is a sandbox environment. So the idea is that it is used for testing, for prototyping, for learning, for getting started quickly, like it is fine to start your project with Expo Go. And it's basically um, an app that has all the native um, libraries from a specific SDK cut into it. So if you go to the docs.exploit.dev, you'll have like SDK 50, then all the libraries that are part of the SDK um, would be in Expo Go, so you can use them. Um, that means that you will only be writing JavaScript code and this JavaScript bundle uh, gets you know, bundled up, put mm. into this Expo Go app, and it can use the native libraries that are there. Then this can obviously only take you so far. So eventually you'll get to the point where you're, you want to use a library that maybe isn't part of Expo at all, or you want to upgrade to a library from a different SDK and you don't want to wait or you need to, for some reason, like change like native code yourself. So those are things that you can't do within Expo Go at all. So at this point, you want to use development build. So you want to create your own native build, which uses all the libraries that you use from Expo Go, plus whatever, whatever else you want. And that's what development builds are. So a development build is basically Expo Go, plus whatever else you need. So you're creating, you can think of it as like you're creating your own customized version of Expo Go. And then that means you can customize the native code as well. So I think it's quite common for people to start off with Expo Go because it's so easy to get started because like, you know, the, um, the app is already on the app store and then, you know, it just also downloads and then you just write JavaScript and then away you go. And then, yeah, so you yeah. can, yeah, Sorry. I think just 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 today I saw a tweet from either a person at Callstack or software mentioned saying that hey, please stop using Expo Go for anything beyond MVPs. It was actually kind of kind of harsh tweet. I wasn't sure why why it was so direct because I think they're also <laughs> working on this. I don't know if you saw it, but um, I mean, Expo Go is great for for people getting started and for beginners. Mm -hmm. um, like you got the QR code thing where you can just scan it and have the app on your device, which is pretty impressive mm -hmm. um but yeah it can be confusing as like people add new stuff and don't understand why they now can't use expo go anymore. exactly yeah i think that's why we're trying to encourage people to move away from expo go sooner rather than later because when you create like a new extra project like by default it will open in expo go mm -hmm. so like when i create my own apps like i'll do um, expo in it and then I immediately add dev client and then you know I'm not using expo go at all so if you say dev client it means you do expo pre-build no that is not <laughs> correct yeah so the dev client is a library um, and basically mm. yeah so expo go is a sandbox environment and then if you're not using expo go you need to have 
uh, like the sandbox environment included that the a development client. But then if you're not using Expert Go, you need to have the development client. So um, to go basically from Expert Go to a development build, so not Expert Go, all you really do is you install Expert Dev Client and then you build the native app. So if you're using EIS, this would be ES build, platform, whatever, and then profile development. This will create a, an ad hoc build or um, kind of a, a development version of your build that you can install on your device or simulator or whatever you need. Um, so where pre-build comes in is if you don't want to use EIS or, or you can't, or you want to build the app locally yourself, then, okay. So what pre-build is, have you, do you know about uh, CNG, the continuous native generation? Yes, I think so, but explain it better. <laughs> okay. okay, so when you, when you create an expo, uh, an app with the expo CLI, so you know, you create expo, um, you will just have some JavaScript code, right? But mm -hmm. then in order to publish this app to the stores or like create a, a proper native app, you, you need the native code. So where is the native code? And the CNG is the idea that your iOS and Android directories can be generated based off of your config files. So <laughs> think of like your node modules, like you're not going to check in your node modules to get, because that would be crazy because mm. they're huge. Yeah. Right? But you have your yarn lock or PMPM lock or whatever you use, and then based off of your package JSON and that lock file, you can generate your node modules, right? And so you're, you're, you're totally fine deleting them. And with CNG, so continuous native generation, the idea is that based off of your app JSON, and your package JSON, a couple of things, we can generate these iOS and Android directories. So they are ephemeral, so they're, they're, they're throwaway. Mm -hmm. And that's what pre-build does. So when you do MPX, like a MPX Expo pre-build, it looks at your config and it generates these iOS and Android folders. And now you have the native, that, that creates this native code for you locally, and then you can run, run the app. So the idea is that, so that's what EIS basically does. So if you build with EIS, it checks out your code, it runs pre-build and then generates your app bundle. So by running pre-build locally, you're basically doing the same steps as EIS, but manually. So you're doing MPX Expo pre-build and then you have your iOS and Android folders and then you can you can run them locally. The, yeah. Yeah, that, that's it's interesting. Yeah, I haven't thought about that before, but basically pre-build is just a step of EAS build and I can just do it locally and then do NPX Expo run iOS to mm -hmm. like get the CNG working locally. Uh, yes, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's that's a good way. But uh, one addition, so you, you said dev client before. I think this is like an NPM package we can install and then we have mm -hmm. to like import one line of, of the dev client. Um I can also do a pre-build without the dev client because I usually do this and I forget about the dev client. The The difference is, I think, and you might correct me on this, if I install the dev client package and, and integrate it, I kind of get the same look and feel for for my app bundle. Like if I would use the Expo Go app, like I get this QR code thing and I get this <clears> shake <throat> to get to the menu back. Whereas if I don't include dev client, I just have the regular like React Native debugging tools. Is that the difference if I don't like with the dev client? Uh, at least, possibly. at least that's my feeling because I I, I rarely install the dev client. I mm. just do like in my tutorials. Okay, let's do a pre-build because we use native stuff, and then I install the app and it runs and I have hot reload and everything works. It's just that when I like shake it, I just get this like bottom sheet. Yeah, I don't one. get the cool Expo Go bottom sheet. Yeah. Um. <sighs> You know what? I think I'm, I'm the converse. I've never run pre-build without installing the dev client, so I'm not 100 percent sure what would happen. I think you're, you know, more than I do at this point. Maybe, maybe trial and error. But um, on a topic of the dev client, I think somewhere in the docs I read that you can, if you're using the dev client, also like shape the menu or the buttons you see in there, like in this dev client. Is it possible to like customize your dev client? So 
I, you know, as part of my doing a little bit of work on every single part of Expo, I did actually do a small change to the dev client. Um, and I don't think you can customize it yourself. As in, like, it's it's open source. You can look at the code. But... I wonder at which point in the mm -hmm. documentation I saw this, the, the launcher screen. I mean, you can, like, customize... Couldn't you oh, customize... Maybe, you know what? Maybe you can. Because, like, uh, I didn't look very deeply into all the codes. I just changed the order of some of the buttons. <laughs> but also, like, I, I can't see it in the docs anymore. So maybe it was removed. I don't it know. was a maybe dream. <laughs> Yeah, I, I also don't know, like, why I should change it, but, um, yeah, well. Um, by the way, the thing that kind of, like, scares me about the whole config plugins and app JSON is that I've worked with Cordova in the past a lot. I don't know if you've used it before. Um, so there was, like, a, a config XML for Cordova in which you had, mm -hmm. like, you could specify blocks. It was an XML file, which was very, very great. But yeah. basically, Cordova also generated your projects based on this XML file. And that always caused problems in the end um, because, like, it regenerates your native project and then it includes some dependencies and some parts are working. And then they had, like, some pre-hooks and post-hooks and, like, everything was totally messed up and the whole community like at some point didn't like this magical approach. Mm -hmm. And now I'm seeing pretty much the same pattern in, in Expo with the, with the app JSON. Um, have you heard about any problems people had with config plugins or with like the magic generation based on, on the app JSON or is, is everything fine so far? Um, I mean, I think in general, like it is like a non-trivial thing that happens. So there's always going to be some like confusion there, especially people who don't understand what's going on uh, under the hood. Um, Trying to think. Well, firstly, we're using JSON, not XML, so that's already better, <laughs> oh, <yeah>. right? <laughs> <laughs> that's a whole lot better, definitely. Yeah, this this XML yeah. and the stuff it was horrible. I, I I think I wrote something to parse it at some point as well. Like if you wanted to oh, do something, XML it was parser? just oh no. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think, well, I think one takeaway from here is that if you choose to use CNG, you know, with 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 pre built and then you know, make sure that your iOS and Android directories are a throwaway, there's a lot of like benefits to doing it. I mean, one thing, for example, is you will never have an easier time upgrading React Native than if you're using CNG with pre built because you Upgrade React Native, upgrade Expo, and then run MPX Expo install dash dash fix. And it automatically, well, automatically <laughs> upgrades all the libraries to uh, SDK compatible ones. And then you run pre build to regenerate your native apps. And that's it. So if you've had experience, for example, you know, in the React Native upgrade helper trying to figure out all the bits and pieces of native code to copy paste, you know, that's the pain that this approach takes away. But there's always going to be a trade-off. Like you said, there's, you know, a config-based uh, generation. So if you have a really complicated project with lots of config plugins, you know, that edits the info P list or, or, or you know, adds things to your pod file, um, like post it all, like, you know, it, it's going to get a little bit complicated, but that's the, but that's the trade-off. But one thing to note also is that it is not a lock-in, like using Expo, Expo tooling, at any point you can choose to like just go the plain reactive native route. All you need to do is run pre-build and then delete your app JSON. And that's it, now you have a plain React Native project. So it's not like you've cho you've chosen this Expo pre-build route and now you're stuck with it and you have to deal with it. Like you don't, you, at any point you can choose to just, right, I'm going to run pre-build and I'm going to manage my native directories yourself. Obviously going from managing it yourself to using pre-build is uh, that that's more difficult. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm going to clip that for you so you can play that about 500 times in 2024 as people tell you where Expo Eject is and that they're still locked oh, no. in with Expo. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to clip this for you, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm, I mean, I've I've said this with with Cedric on the podcast before in some of my videos that you're not locked in, but you will always get like something mm. like, but it's Expo and you're locked in. I'm like, no, just like you can break out of this. Oh, I have to do eject. No, you don't have to. Oh, come on, just do whatever you want. <laughs> <laughs> it, yeah, it must yeah, be exactly. a hard time uh, at Expo to like get all of this right. Well. I think it's it just comes with uh, with the amount of change we've had in uh, like the change of direction we've had in a company. That's you know, Expo has tried. We've tried lots of different things until mm -hmm. we figured out what's actually worked. And there's bravery in deciding to change when things aren't working and like you know pivoting to a different direction. There's bravery in making that decision and. I think we've reached a good point now, but the consequences of that is obviously, obviously, you know, going full force with like several different iterations until we get to the good, good, like to the, to the good spot. Right? You know, you just, you're going to have some, uh, some history in the project, especially, you know, on the internet. If people Google things, they're still going to end up finding, yeah. you know, responses from two or three years ago that are no longer valid, but we just can't can't add a footnote everywhere on the internet going like, read the video stocks. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Speaking of history, under every video I do with React, I get at least one comment that I should do the same for Angular Ionic because that's oh. my background for the last seven years. And whenever I do anything with React, I just get a question, can you also do this with Angular? <laughs> like... <laughs> But that's a different topic. But um, you talked about change, which brings me to a good point. Uh, there is change in the air. Uh, Expo SDK 50 is probably already released when this podcast episode goes live. Um, so do you know, like, we don't have to go through everything of SDK 50, but let's talk maybe about uh, the relevant parts uh, regarding EAS. Um, I think... In SDK 49, you added something like custom GitHub actions, um, mm -hmm. if I remember this correctly. Is there anything cool, or I'm, I'm pretty sure there's something cool, but uh, what's coming to, to EAS in, in SDK 50? To EAS in SDK 50? Because um, you, you, one, one of the notes you had for me is like, what's new in SDK 50? So <laughs> I was trying to think like the two things that I would mention actually that are, are exciting yeah. are the like dev tools plugins so that came from uh, flipper getting decoupled from react native so basically it was previously um, react native the you know community went all in on flipper so it's like part of the react native template and then if you want to like create plugins for like dev tools then you would create them, like you would create Flipper plugins because that was like the mm -hmm. go-to tool. And then it was announced that Flipper is getting decoupled. And I think since it, it has since been removed from React Native Core as well. Yeah. And then from here, it was um, basically an idea to create another way to create plugins. So that's that's why uh, from SDK 50, you can now do DevTools plugins. So the use case for that is, for example, if you using Apollo or Urkel, um, or you know, for example, a GraphQL client, and then it will be convenient to see the network traffic. Then you know, you can the support for creating plugins for that that you can mm. just you and Crow just handy. Or if I use like a state management library and want to add a plugin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> mm, nice. And um, and the other thing um, was this: there's, there's going to be continuously larger and larger focus on web so creating um kind of we're very strong on native on the native side on ios and android and we want to create um i'm not sure if i'm as bold enough to call it parity but like we want to create a stronger web offering as well the idea being that you could very confidently you know use Expo for web, iOS, and Android. So I think a really exciting thing that's um, in beta now from SDK 50 is Expo Router 3, which comes with um, API routes, which are in beta. And that's really, really exciting because it's the first time that you can write server-side code in your kind of React Native world. So we're always, you know, focused, especially if people coming from the web, we're always focusing, we're going like, you know, your mobile app is a website. It is mm -hmm. not secret, do not put secrets there. 
whereas this actually, um, you know, the idea being that this will create a way for you to query server side routes. So you could, for example, have your, um, you know, API keys on the server side that your app or your website can call. And um, yeah, and obviously the other thing for using Expo Router for web and native is that you get deep linking almost for free. It will be the quickest deep linking integration because obviously file-based routing, and if you use the same for web and native, it will just like, pew, um, which is awesome. Be, be aware, everyone, universal links for iOS and app links for Android are still an unbelievable pain to set up because <laughs> of the domain validation and every, I don't know. Have you done it before? Have you, have you like gone through the process? Uh, yes, but you like host that asset file, asset links, JSON file on your domain at the like dot yeah. well now and so folder. And you got like put the right IDs everywhere and everything has to match. Yeah, it was, I think the hardest part was usually getting it um, deployed to the the correct endpoint, which a lot of the time, you know, me as a mobile developer do not have access to. So it's, it's more like finding a team, um, <laughs> like finding the approvals. <laughs> so it's like, you know, it's, it's kind of like usually the people who need to set it up, web develop, uh, mobile developers, like maybe don't have as, as much access to the, to the website. So yeah. And then you better get it right the first time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, you're. Yeah. But um, yeah, this is interesting. I mean, you you mentioned the focus from Expo f about Expo Web or like building for the web, um, and I think this is going to be a very big topic in 2024. So in mm. like next week, I'm interviewing. I hope I pronounce it like Shimon, this the the 17 year old who's working at at Callstack, and he gave a talk about React uh, React server components with React Native recently, mm -hmm. and. I'm talking to Theo in two weeks. Um, oh, nice! So yeah, uh, I, I feel like we're ta talking uh, a lot about React uh, server components this year and Expo Web. And there's one more thing. I don't know if you have insight into this, but as far as I know, Mark Lawler is also now working at Expo, mm -hmm. um, who is or has worked on Native Wind, which is like the library to use Tailwind with React Native. My like what I heard from Cedric before was that maybe native wind would be bundled with the Expo SDK or there's a major version around. Do you know anything about the, the state of native wind? <laughs> oh, <laughs> you're not allowed no. to talk. Oh. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, I'm joking. I, I don't know. Uh, yeah, don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, we're gonna we're gonna see what happens when they, when we'll, we'll we'll see what happens. Yeah. But I, I think there's a, it's, it's a very good team um, currently working on the web side of things. So I think some I think you're right in that there's going to be exciting things coming uh, coming out on the website in the next in the next year. Oh, and I'll just be. I didn't even mention we have like there's like bundle splitting. That was the other thing in in SDK fifty, which is like it's huge because bundle splitting with Metro. <laughs> <laughs> that is like you know it's 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 quite the achievement but that is like you know a prerequisite to all the other web focused i think that was like in like wasn't it like beta in 49 is it now stable or is this new wasn't it like um i am not 100 percent sure yeah me, me neither um something evan did something in X, in router version 2 mm. splitting async routes i don't know um Gonna gonna have to look this up and probably gonna do another stream on this. But yeah, exactly. We uh, can't give we can't give all the answers. You need to do some research. <laughs> right, right. Um, so, do you know what's coming to EAS then in the future? Um, is there anything planned? I don't know in how far you're involved, like in the internal planning. Maybe you can't talk about everything, but <laughs> <laughs> do you know roughly if there are any like cool things coming? And I mean, it's already super easy. Like I can commit, <laughs> it is built. I can even automatically submit to iOS and Android app store with EIS. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know how you can make that even better, but like, is there anything planned? So I think we want to make EAS like a bit like more flexible. So one thing that I think people don't realize that often don't realize that they can do is you can run generic jobs. So you can like run your tests or your linting or things like I can, that. I can like, mine Bitcoin. I think Cedric told me this. <laughs> <laughs> <You stand. laughs> 
<laughs> Shimon's going to shut you down. <laughs> um, yeah, so you can you can do generic uh, jobs, and I think we want to make that a lot easier and and a lot more straightforward for for people to do and to use. So the idea is that you could use EAS like for your for your main like build tool, as in like you know run test there, run linting, like you know everything you would on on CI. Because I think uh, mostly people can still think of EAS as it's just a place you build your app, like rather mm. than, you know, putting it that like as part of your CI CD flow. So we don't really want to make that a lot simpler. And the other thing, actually something that I, I worked on end of last year is um, we added build annotations to EAS. And it's basically like debugging. When things go well, it's really great. <laughs> but then debugging native errors is mm. really, really complicated. Especially because both iOS and Android builds, like they, the the amount of logs that get printed out, it's like thousands and thousands of lines, and there's a lot of like warnings. <clears throat> there's a lot of even like you know highlighted text, so that to figure out why your build actually failed is often really really tricky. And obviously, people who've been reacting to developers for a while who've experienced all these build errors the hard way you, you know you you would know where to look and like you know you'd, you'd have mm-hmm. you'd be able to debug things more effi- efficiently <clears throat> so build annotations are basically notes on eas on build logs on some of the like common uh, mistakes or common errors to kind of like help nudge people the right way in um, in fixing their own builds so uh, an example of that is <clears throat> um, if you, okay, uh, on Android, um, if you publish, if you submit your app to the Play Store, um, you need to, every time, increment your build number. So mm-hmm. if you have version one, build number one, and then you have uploaded it, and you have version one, build number one, you upload it again, you're going to get an error. So... <laughs> and it's just like you, you know, can't believe how often I got that error. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, so so th- if if you actually get that error these days, and you go to the submission logs page, then there'll be an annotation there that says like, oh, you know, this is why this is happening. Here's the fix. So these are like kind of common things that we have picked up on that people run into a lot like often, and then try to kind of when you're like, oh no, it didn't work. Why didn't it work? And it will be like kind of like a hint to draw your attention to um, how to fix it. So we'll see how that goes. I, I wonder if you could feed the, the build logs to AI and let just AI figure out what went wrong with the build. I, I would expect that AI could solve this and say, <laughs> hey, you you messed up something like... You know what? That's actually like one of the things that we've considered doing. Um but uh, yeah, not not yet live. Yet. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, if you if you want to like feed the whole build log of something to AI, it's gonna cost you a lot all the time because the build log is so yeah. unbelievable long. Yeah, I think it's also like knowing where to look. So, for example, if you have an iOS build failure, then a lot of the time the underlying error is in the Xcode logs. So mm-hmm. when like I'm helping other people debug their builds, I always have to basically like they will just. Um, read out the last line um, in the like the the build uh, the fast lane like command, and you will say something like, "Oh, fast lane script failed." And we're mm. like, "Yep, that's not the error." <laughs> so you have to download the Xcode logs and then go to the very end, and then you find a line that starts with error colon, and that gives you the error. But the thing is, like you know, like I know that, but like I know it because I've lived it. <laughs> so it's just like, how do I tell everyone else? That's 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 a great topic for another video. You gave me so many ideas today. Um, so so how do I find my Xcode logs or how to find my error? <laughs> it's a great video topic, definitely. Mm. Uh, also, what is Expo in twenty twenty four? I I will reserve that title. <laughs> I, I mean, I can't. I did a video last year. I think sh- should you use Expo in twenty twenty three or something? It was like my most viewed video oh, where wow. I just. Like where I described everything that people said against Expo and why it's not true in 2023 anymore, but now it's 2024 and 
yeah, maybe I'll just do it again. I mean, <laughs> yeah, this, gotta, this is still true. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's still true. Okay, we're gonna have to wrap up here soon. Uh, this was already awesome. Now, I got one last question for you, and I hope you can give us some. This is maybe off the script. I think I just added this question uh, today because I looked a bit through your work and everything you did. And you gave a really great talk last year at AppJS, uh, which was called Building a Five Star, Five -star app. app. Yeah. So I know we don't have 60 minutes or how long the talk was, or 25 minutes. But <laughs> um, for those who did not enjoy that talk, could you briefly describe, I mean, and give the answer to how can I build a five star app? I think it has to do with reviews, but maybe you can like just give us the, the golden nuggets of that the talk golden and, nuggets. And how we can build better apps. Yeah. Well, I think um, the, the talk itself is about app ratings and reviews. So the rating Uh, the star rating of your app like has a huge impact in how like people's choice especially if you're building something that has lots of alternatives you know if you're building like a to-do list app and there's you know 20 then people are going to go through through all 20 oh well you know so at least a significant amount and look at the reviews so you want the uh, like a large amount of reviews and you also want to maintain like a high-ish rating. And interestingly, the um, the average ratings for apps are significantly higher on iOS than Android, which I thought was quite interesting. So mm. on iOS, if you want to have a good rating, you are aiming for 4.8, 4.9. On Android, mm. if you want a good rating, like 4.6 is actually like a pretty good rating on Android. So like on average, Android ratings are lower, which I thought was interesting. Hmm. And um, the idea of how to um, build an app that's a, a five-star app, well, obviously, <laughs> you, I'm rounding up here, really, it's going to be a 4.9-star app, <laughs> <laughs> um, is uh, there's, there's kind of two parts of it. So the first part is to really battle test the common things that that give people that kind of negative reaction that makes them want to write a bad review. So really in order to counter one one star review, you need to get, you know, 20 or 30 mm. or 40 five star reviews, right? So you so you really want to give people a positive experience so they don't write this one star review to begin with. So things um people hate things that they can't recover from. So app crashes is like the number one thing. So if you have Sentry or any kind of error monitoring, then like app crashes should be your priority one to fix. And also people really hate errors where they don't know what happened and they don't have a solution. So yeah, sure, maybe, you know, you are working on an app that has, you know, the, the backend servers have like spikes of traffic mm. where, you know, sometimes you just, you just don't get a response. And then like showing just an error versus showing an error with a retry explanation, you know, like steps that they can like do, like create some positive experience. So that's, you know, the, um, the one part. And the other part is obviously asking for positive reviews. So if you look at all the apps that have a good rating, um, people tend to, There are very nice people out there who do go, oh, this app is amazing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like give it five stars. And they you know, go to the app store and then find the app and then give it five stars. But most people don't. So you need to make it as easy as possible. I think in my talk, actually, I likened it to going to a hotel. Like, you know, the hotel where I stayed at, you know, it was a nice hotel. I, to be honest, I didn't go to Google. And I didn't give it five stars mm. or even four stars. But if, as I was leaving that hotel, there was someone with an iPad that says like, oh, do you want to rate this hotel? I would have been like, given it five stars. And that's kind of the experience you want to create in your app as well. So you don't want to annoy people, but if they're at the end of a positive interaction, they've maybe they've just bought something or they've just successfully completed their 10th to-do item, like that is the point where you go, oh, are you enjoying the app? And then if they say, no, then, you know, you can give them 
some way to give feedback. If they say yes, you can, you know, prompt them to um, to write a review. So that you kind of want to like, I think it's important to capture that they're probably in a good mood. So this is a good time to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I sometimes get this um, like, hey, do you like this app? And if I click no, they will they will not send me to the app store. They will say, oh, how can we do better? Or send us an email. But if you click yeah. yes, you would, okay, leave us a rating. So they like pre-capture if you're like, like your mood is like, yeah. does this person like or not like the app? So in the case of you're not liking the app, they won't recommend you to go to the app store. They they will yeah. like tell you to send a support email or something instead. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. That's 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 the other common thing to do because you know, ideally, like you would like you really want to like fix the things that are wrong, like outside of you know a one star rating on your app on your on your app store, which a lot of the time you know people either don't write any comments or just say this sucks. You're like. <laughs> How do I make it not? Please help. <laughs> yeah, I I must admit I barely write comments. Like, yeah, when I get like this pop over, I sometimes click on it. I, I leave some stars, but I rarely mm. write something. And I also, I had an application which got wildly popular. It was free completely. Mm -hmm. But now I looked at it and it only has two ratings. So I don't know. I did not publish a new version. But like, do ratings disappear after five or six months or something? Did, what? So they shouldn't. I mean, okay. So actually, the way ratings works work are different from iOS and Android. What else is new, right? Um, but it's uh, like th they should be lifetime ratings on both. Um, and on iOS, you can choose to reset the um, yeah. the 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 rating itself. But but I never did. So you start I never from did. from nothing. Yeah. But I never did. This oh, is interesting. The ratings are different uh, for different regions as well. So if you're, you know, uh, the country that you're based, you're going to be that country's app store. So if you go to like um, that app, but the US version, like US store, then you'll have different ratings. Interesting. Yeah, I always looked at um, App Store Connect, which is like the the management application. Mm -hmm. Uh, but now I signed into the App Store and looked it up, and I'm most likely in the German App Store, and I only mm. saw two ratings. So uh, if I go down into App Store Connect, I will likely find my ratings. Um, anyway, this is going to be interesting because this app was developed with Capacitor, and I kind of want to update it Ooh. to like use React Native. So like I completely need to uh, replace it. But if I use the same bundle ID, I think it should be possible. Only yep. problem is um, the application is using, I think, SQLite. So I don't Ooh. know if that bundle will get wiped out if I switch over to React Native. I mean, this is like a total edge case of like swapping technologies. I mean, the SQLite database should be the same. Like this is tied to the app itself and not Capacitor or React Native. But So is it like, is it saved in the user's local storage, like in, in the async storage? Because um, that, that will be the same. Like if you use the same key for the async store. I, I must look into it, but probably I think so. Yeah. Uh, and by the way, yeah, well, 4.5 out of 4. Well, if I anyway have a bad rating, I could just like rebuild the whole application <laughs> and <laughs> ship a new one. <laughs> what is the, what app is it? What does it do? Uh, it's it's called Quick Track. Um, Quick track. My idea was like when, when I was on diet, I always wanted to track my food, mm -hmm. but most apps like LifeSum and whatever, they... They want to want you to track everything, like track all the macros, like the carbs and the fat and everything. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted a quick way, like say I ate oats and I know this is 550 calories. That's yeah. it. And I made an app for that so that I can just like quickly track it and have like favorite. This is my oatmeal I eat every day. It is 500 calories. Please add it. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it also uses a QR scanner with a free API to like access oh, nice. barcodes or something. Um, yeah, and it's a, actually it has 60 ratings. It is completely free. I never monetized it. Um, but I think this is something I want to want to upgrade this year. But this is beyond... Uh, <laughs> beyond but I, I will probably use EAS for that application uh, because yes. you explained Good it segue. really, 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 really <laughs> way. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. thank you so much for taking the time today and explaining this. I think we're going to have uh, uh, many more sessions probably until people truly understand what Expo is limiting them. 
Uh, yeah, thing. definitely. I um, mean, we have many, uh, I have many colleagues that haven't been on your show, so you need to right. get started to get us all in. <laughs> I, I will, I will certainly. And uh, thank you for taking the time and explaining everything after your vacations. And I, I really hope you're now back in a great mood for more work at Expo. Yeah, honestly, thank you so much, Simon. This was this was a lot of fun, and because it is like my first time this year really talking code again, like I am, I am so in it. <laughs> like I'm ready to go. This is this is yeah, awesome. Yeah, thank you so oh, much. Awesome. Um, where can people find out more about you and the things you have done so far? Just a quick plug. Oh, um, I think uh, Twit X. Uh, t Twitter slash X um, and on GitHub. I have like all the, um, you know, more interesting courses that I've done are if you go to my profile on GitHub, which is just Caddy Um It's on my, on the, on the readme there. Or alternatively, my DMs are open on X. So, um, yeah. I, I, will, I will put both links in the show notes and I hope that if we talk again at the end of 2024, you, your X Twitter uh, bio reads like instructor at front end masters, egghead and galaxies dev. Wouldn't that be great? Like <laughs> well, some, we'll see some what cool we can EA, do. EA, <laughs> some cool EAS course or something on galaxies. That would be pretty nice. Anyway, <laughs> uh, hashtag goals for 2024. <laughs> All right. Um, thank you again. I will put everything in the show note and I will hopefully catch you again in the future. Thanks for joining me. Awesome. Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye.